The date was June the 14th, 2020. Tyler Reddick was involved in a NASCAR event at Homestead Miami Speedway. As he raced toward the finish line, solidly in fourth place, he began to slow down. The problem was he had only completed 266 of the 267 needed laps. His crew listened as he let off the throttle and started to thank them for a great car and a solid race. But his spotter, Derek Nealon, and his crew chief, Randall Burnett, immediately got on the radio. Keep going, keep going, go, it's the last lap, dog, go, go. Well, stopping or slowing down at the end of a NASCAR race may be disappointing, but stopping or slowing down in our spiritual race is deadly. And that's what I want us to think about for a few moments this morning. The first section of the book of Joshua ended, if you remember back a few weeks ago, with God's part. He calls us and He enables us. And our part, we have to trust Him. That same theme continues on in chapters 13 through 21. And if you read ahead, and I know some of you do, you may have read chapters 13 to 19 and wondered, What in the world is Pastor Bill going to do with this section? Because these are chapters that we very often would just kind of skip through, and there are so many geographical references. Our temptation would be just to kind of throw a map up like this that shows what the tribes got and call it good. But there is truth in these chapters that we need to grab a hold of and learn and apply to our lives. There really is a point to this section. The main point is very simply, God keeps His promises. More than 450 years before this, God had promised Abraham that He would give His family that land. Back in chapter 1, verse 3, God had promised Joshua that He would give him the land and allow him to lead the people into the land. And now as we come to chapters 13 to 19, we're going to see God giving the land. For Israel, these chapters are not mind-numbing geographical details. For Israel, these chapters were saying, it's ours. God kept His promise. When we purchased our first house, I mean, we cleaned the whole thing. We looked in every nook and cranny, every closet, the attic, the basement, all over it because it was ours. And that's kind of Israel's response to these chapters. And while the land is not ours, there are lessons that you and I can learn from it. Joshua 13 through 21 actually records how every tribe got their homeland. The word inheritance occurs over 50 times. Last week, somebody asked me, you've made the statement that you love the book of Joshua. Why? And I gave him a quick synopsis. But here's one of the reasons. Because the book of Joshua is the capstone of the Pentateuch. The first five books are God telling Abraham and his family that he will dwell with them in the land. Joshua is where that happens. Genesis opens with God walking with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. But their failure ends that fellowship and God promises He will dwell with His people. And that comes about, we'll see in chapter 18, when the tabernacle is settled right in the middle of the land and God is dwelling among His people. And the land that He's giving them is the land to which Messiah will come. As God's redemptive plan unfolds throughout history. And we know the story, Israel will also fail, but God will still come in the person of Jesus Christ to dwell with his people. And someday, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth and dwelling with God. And and all of this with Canaan is just kind of a foreshadowing of what will someday be a reality for us. God's part is that He faithfully keeps His promises. And so on one end of this section, in chapter 11, we see Joshua took the whole land. 
according to all that the Lord had spoken to Moses. And Joshua gave it for an inheritance to Israel according to their tribal allotments and the land had rest from war. On the other end of the section is chapter 21, verses 43 to 45, which says very much the same thing. Thus the Lord gave to Israel all the land that he swore to give their fathers. And they took possession of it and they settled there. And the Lord gave them rest on every side just as he had sworn to their fathers. Not one of all their enemies had withstood them, for the Lord had given all their enemies into their hands. Not one word of all the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel had failed. All came to pass. God keeps his promises. Now, even as we move through the passages this morning, you're going to feel a tension. The tension that we're going to feel is what in the New Testament the scholars call already but not yet. The sense that you and I who know Christ are already seated in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus, Paul tells us. But we're not yet fully there, are we? The fact that in Christ, God looks at us and sees us as completely righteous, as sanctified. And yet, as Pastor Ryan talked about last week, we're still being sanctified already, but not yet. And so we're going to read statements that Israel has the land, but we're also going to see it It's not yet that they need to reach out and claim and take the land, believe the promises of God. So God's part is that he faithfully keeps his promises. Our part is that we don't want to stop short of the finish line. That we want to respond to the grace and the promises of God properly. And so we're going to fly over chapters 13 to 19 this morning. And we're going to pull out of those chapters some nuggets that show responses to God's grace. That show in actuality some people stopping short of the finish line and some people responding properly. So the first response, there are four, two negative, two positive. The first response I want us to look at is a negative response. As we are urged by this text, don't respond with half-hearted complacency. See, we can take God's promises for granted. We can seek to coast in our spiritual life. We can fail to do our part in response to God's part. And we see that unfolding in chapters 13 to 19. At the very beginning of chapter 13, verse 6, God says, I myself will drive them out from before the people of Israel, only allot the land to Israel for an inheritance as I have commanded you. I am going to drive them out, but they have a responsibility. You divide up the land and they need to settle in and claim the area that their tribe is given. Joshua had broken the power of the Canaanites. He broken those coalitions, conquered them. But there were still cities to be conquered. There were still small armies to be defeated. That was now the responsibility of each tribe. The half-tribe of Manasseh and then the tribes of Reuben and Gad were given an inheritance by Moses on the other side of the Jordan. And they were challenged, remember, to cross over with the other tribes and conquer the land. They obeyed. They did that. Now chapter 13, beginning after verse 6, lays out what those tribes got as an inheritance. And here's where we see the half-hearted complacency. Because verse 13 tells us the people of Israel did not drive out the Geshurites or the Makathites, but Geshur and Makath dwell in the midst of Israel to this day. When the book was written, there were still Canaanites living in that Transjordan region that they didn't drive out. And Judah, Judah, the leading tribe of Israel, the tribe from which Messiah will come, they are given the largest area, the largest territory, chapters 14, verse 1 through chapter 15, verse 63, but they failed to take it. Not all of it. In fact, the chapter 15 ends with, But the Jebusites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the people of Judah could not drive out. So the Jebusites dwell with the people of Judah at Jerusalem to this day when the book was written. In fact, they will be troublemakers until David finally conquers Jerusalem. They didn't do what God called them to do. They didn't claim all of the promise that God had given them. 
The tribe of Ephraim, another key tribe, in fact, Joshua's tribe, didn't take their territory. Their territory is described in chapter 16, but verse 10 of chapter 16 says, they did not drive out the Canaanites who lived in Gezer. So the Canaanites have lived in the midst of Ephraim to this day, but have been made to do forced labor. Notice it doesn't say they couldn't, it says they didn't drive them out. And they subject them, but they subject them to being slaves. So they choose materialism over obedience. They decide our profit from having these slaves is more important than our obedience to God. Their brother tribe of Manasseh also fails to drive out the Canaanites from their territory. Yet the people of Manasseh, chapter 17, verse 12, could not take possession of those cities, but the Canaanites persisted in dwelling in that land. Now, when the people of Israel grew strong, they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but did not utterly drive them out. They didn't claim the land. They were complacent. They were half-hearted in their obedience. And later, those people that they enslaved in the book of Judges will then turn the tables and enslave Israel as well. Seven of the tribes at this point don't even have an inheritance in the land. They have been content to just stay nomads and kind of wander around the land with their flocks. And Joshua has to challenge them in chapter 18, verse 1. Then the whole congregation of the people of Israel assembled at Shiloh and set up the tent of meeting there. The tabernacle is now central in the land. The land lay subdued before them. It's already conquered. Yet there remained, not yet, there remained among the people of Israel seven tribes whose inheritance had not been apportioned. So Joshua said to the people of Israel, How long will you put off going in to take possession of the land which the Lord, the God of your fathers, has given you? That phrase, how long will you put off, is really how long will you be slack in doing this? We might say today, how long are you going to be slackers? Do what God commanded you. Claim what God has given to you. Maybe they were weary of war after seven years. You can understand that. Maybe they had just become complacent and needed to be challenged to see the vision again. And so Joshua challenges them. He rebukes them. He says, I want each of you seven tribes to choose three men and send them out as a survey team to survey the land. And then come back here and we will take what you've surveyed and by lots, God will give you your portion. And so you read in chapter 18 that Benjamin gets a segment of the land. In chapter 19, Simeon and Zebulun and Issachar and Asher and Naphtali and Dan are are given territories. And so it looks something like this. The land is divided up and yet they have to claim what they've been given. You can't really see it very well, but right there on the seacoast, on the west, in the middle is the tribe of Dan. And you really can't see up to the north, right in the middle, is where the tribe of Dan ends up. Because you see, chapter 19 ends when the territory of the people of Dan was lost to them. The people of Dan went up and fought against Lashem, and after capturing it and striking it with the sword, they took possession of it. That's a really encapsulated version of a pretty sordid story that's told in the book of Judges, chapter 18. They leave their God-given territory and go way north. One commentator said this is geographical apostasy because they're leaving the area God gave them and choosing to go their own way. And all of this is encapsulated in Judges chapter 1 where you see tribe after tribe fail to take the land God has given, fail to obey God. In fact, the phrase that occurs over and over in Judges 1 is they did not drive out. And then it fills in a a nation that they didn't drive out. And it serves as a warning to us not to respond to the grace and the promises of God with half-heartedness. Not to be complacent. Not to sit back and coast and think that somehow we've arrived, but to understand that until God takes us home to heaven, we are to be growing continually in Christ-likeness. Peter says it this way in 2 Peter chapter 1. God's divine power has granted to us a few things. All things that pertain to life and godliness. Everything we need to live life 
and be Christ-like, God has made available to us. His word, his spirit, his people, his gifts. He's made that available through the knowledge of him who has called us to his own glory and excellence. He's called us to be like him, to be like Christ. By which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises. Greater than what God gave to Israel. So that through them you might become partakers of the divine nature. Does that mean we become gods? No, it means we become Christ-like. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort, claim what God has given us. Make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. Notice how many of those things are part of the fruit of the Spirit. He's saying, make every effort to claim the promises and the power of God and become more and more and more like Jesus Christ day by day by day. That's what God has laid before us as our inheritance. The story is told of a, an old farmer who every time there was a testimony time at church would stand up and say, well, I'm not making much progress in my Christian life, but I'm established. Well, he had a neighbor that was really bothered by that, but didn't really know how to help him, how to approach him. And one day he was walking down the road and he saw Farmer Jones ahead with his wagon loaded with heavy logs. And as he got closer, he noticed that those logs had caused the wagon wheels to sink into the mud of the road. And even though the horses were pulling, they couldn't move it. And he looked at him and he said, well, Brother Jones, you must be really happy. You're not making much progress, but you are certainly established. And I wonder how many of us take it that way spiritually. Well, I'm not making a lot of progress, but I know I'm going to heaven. I know I've trusted Christ, but I'm just going to coast. The challenge laid before us by the book of Joshua is to grow in Christ's likeness, to claim our inheritance. I've always liked the story in the Chronicles of Narnia where Lucy meets Aslan, not for the first time, but later on, and she says to him, Aslan, you're bigger. And Aslan says, that's because you're older, little one. She says, not because you're bigger? And he says, no, I am not, but every year you grow, you will find me bigger. See, God doesn't change, but as we grow, we know and appreciate more and more and more who he is, and we come, become more and more and more like him. Don't respond to God's grace with half-hearted complacency. Instead, move ahead confidently rooted in God's promises. See, we can trust God to keep his word and press on. This is the second response. It's the first positive one that we see. God will always keep his word. We can trust that and we can move ahead. Next week, we're going to look, the Lord willing, at the life of Caleb from chapter 14. And he certainly exemplifies this moving ahead confidently. But there are five other people who do as well. Five women Zehelophed had five daughters. When he died, those women, in, recorded in Numbers 27, went to Moses and they said, Our father died, not because he was part of Korah's rebellion in the wilderness, but for his own sin. And we don't believe his name should die out just because he didn't have sons. And God went to Mo, or Moses went to God and he said, This is what they're saying. And God said, They're right. Pretty amazing in that culture and that time that God would say, yes, women should inherit when there isn't a, a man to do it. And so they are promised in Numbers 27 an inheritance. And now, here in Joshua 17, they show up asking for their inheritance. And there are some names there. If some of you are expecting and you want some good girls' names, there's some great names here. His daughters are Mala, Noah, Hagla, Milka, and Tirzah. So give one of those a try, right? Well, they approach Eleazar the priest and Joshua the son of Nun and the leaders and say, The Lord commanded Moses to give us an inheritance along with our brothers. 
So according to the mouth of the Lord, he gave them an inheritance among the brothers of their fathers, among their uncles. What's amazing to me is they come out of the same tribe, Ephraim, Manasseh, the same tribes where we saw earlier they chose material profit over taking their land. And here are these five women saying, God promised us this, give it to us. And Joshua does. They claim the inheritance. And so they challenge us to move ahead confidently, rooted in what God has promised. That's exactly what they're doing. You know, Peggy and I are in this kind of limbo stage, not knowing when God is going to send somebody here. And we have no, some of you have, we have no idea what's next in our redeployment. But it's okay. We don't need to know. God knows, and He will let us know, and and we're not stressed out about it because we can move ahead confidently trusting God's promises. And so can Berean. Move ahead confidently knowing God has the right man who is going to take us on into a greater time than we've had, I believe. And as we think about and consider the possibility of a capital campaign, I don't know what God is going to do. You don't know what God's going to do, but we know God is going to do what is right. And we can trust him, whether that's yes, move ahead, or don't move ahead. We can trust him, and we can move ahead with our lives confidently rooted in what God is doing. We don't want the second negative response, the third response overall. Don't respond to God's grace with grumbling discontent. You know, we can choose to look at God's promises and his provisions And then complain that he hasn't given us enough. And that happens. The same tribe these five women have come out of, that's what they do. Then the people of Joseph spoke to Joshua saying, Why have you given me but one lot and one portion as an inheritance, though I am a numerous people? And now they try to sound spiritual. Since all along the Lord has blessed me. But who assigned them their lot? Every decision it says the lot is cast and every decision is from the Lord the Lord had given them their portion of the land and now they're coming to Joshua and saying we aren't content with it I want you to notice right there kind of in the middle you can see if you're sitting close enough anyway Ephraim and Manasseh And then on the other side of the Jordan, a big area for Manasseh. They have a lot of territory. In fact, more territory than any of the other tribes except perhaps Judah. And they are not among the biggest tribes. God has more than adequately blessed them, but they're complaining. And really, the tribe of Ephraim seems to be complainers by nature. In in Judges chapter 8, they'll complain to Gideon about something. In Judges chapter 12, they'll complain to Jephthah about something. The, The psalmist says the men of Ephraim, though armed with bows, turned back in the day of battle. That seems to be what they are like. And they're Joshua's own tribe. And so he challenges them in chapter 17, verse 15. If you are a numerous people, go up by yourselves to the forest and there clear ground for yourselves in the land of the Perizzites and the Rephaim. Take it, clear the ground, since the hill country of Ephraim is too narrow for you. Just go and take what God has given to you. That's what he's saying to them. But they complain. The hill country is not enough for us. And all the Canaanites who dwell on the plain have chariots of iron. Probably not. I mean, there were certainly chariots, but I doubt all of them had them. Both those in Beth Sheehan and its villages and those in the valley of Jezreel. And they've already forgotten what God did back in chapter 11 when Joshua and Israel faced a massive army with lots of chariots, and yet God gave them an overwhelming victory. And they're doubting the promise that God had given in Deuteronomy 20, verse 1, when he said, when you go out to war against your enemies and see horses and chariots and an army larger than your own, you shall not be afraid of them. For the Lord your God is with you, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. See, the problem with those tribes was not that they had impossible odds, because they had God on their side. The problem is that they want the blessings of the inheritance without the battle. To get it. Joshua challenges them. You can really summarize verses 17 and 18 by saying, just do it. 
Just take what God's given you. You can do it in his power. Joshua said to the house of Joseph, to Ephraim and Manasseh, you are a numerous people. I have great power in God. You shall not have one allotment only, but the hill country shall be yours. For though it is a forest, you shall clear it and possess it to its farthest borders. For you shall drive out the Canaanites, though they have chariots of iron and though they are very strong. And Joshua encourages them, just do it. But they don't. And as we look in the book of Judges, they they don't take their territory, or at least not all of it. Their inheritance was given to them by God, and yet they're rejecting God's provision and God's plan. And they warn us, don't respond to the grace of God in our lives with grumbling discontent. Trust what our Heavenly Father provides. I mentioned last week that when we were on vacation, the weather wasn't the greatest. Usually in a two-week period at, at Hilton Head, we'll get at least five or six beach days, maybe more, and this year it was two. And, and I was really trying hard not to respond with grumbling discontent, to realize we were in a beautiful place. God had given us a lot. And, and one day I said to Peggy, but I was really kind of saying it to myself, you know, I thought we needed more beach days, but apparently we didn't because God didn't give them to us. And that's just a little silly example. Some of you are going through a lot worse circumstances. Some of you are are going through circumstances where you're battling with an illness and you're wondering why God doesn't relieve you of that. Or you're going through financial difficulties. Or there's family strife and, and hardship and you want to see people's hearts change and it's not happening. And our focus needs to be, look at what God has given to us, not what God hasn't given to us. And respond with gratitude for the grace that's there instead of with grumbling discontent. In fact, what we're called to is the fourth response, which is to faithfully obey God. We can choose to be faithful ourselves as a response to God's faithfulness to us. This whole section begins In chapter 13, verse 1, with God speaking to Joshua, tells us that Joshua was old and advanced in years. And we don't like to be told that, but the Lord said to him, you are old and advanced in years. So I guess it was true. Best we can figure, he was somewhere between 85 and 100 at this point. His days of leading Israel into battle are over. And the reality is that the whole nation doesn't need to be united in battle anymore. The tribes need to take the rest of the land. But God says to him, there remains yet very much land to possess. Joshua, there's still something to accomplish. As we saw earlier, verse 6, I'll be with them. I will drive the people out. But your responsibility, Joshua, is to allot the land to Israel for an inheritance as I've commanded you. The word allot literally means to throw something down. It's because they're going to, to choose the segments by casting lots. He says, that's your responsibility, Joshua. You need to make sure the tribes get busy and take their areas. The rest of chapter 13 describes the the tribes on the other side of the Jordan. So the next thing, really chronologically, is that Joshua does what God calls him to do. These are the inheritances, chapter 14, verse 1, that the people of Israel received in the land of Canaan, which Eleazar the priest and Joshua the son of Nun and the heads of the father's houses of the tribes of Israel gave them to inherit. Joshua immediately begins to do what God called him to do. And that's what we've seen throughout the book, isn't it? God says, Joshua, do this. Joshua does it. And he accomplishes it. Chapter 19, verse 51 ends the section by saying, these are the inheritances that Eleazar the priest And Joshua, the son of Nun, and the heads of the fathers' houses of the tribes of the people of Israel, distributed by Lot at Shiloh before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. So they finished dividing the land. God speaks. Joshua obeys. And then when all of that is done, this servant leader accepts his own inheritance. When they'd finished distributing the several territories of the land as inheritances, The people of Israel gave an inheritance among them to Joshua, the son of Nun. By command of the Lord, they gave him the city that he asked for. Timnath, Sarah, where was it? In the hill country of Ephraim, where his tribesmen didn't want. And he rebuilt the city. 
and he settled there. See, the continuing challenge of Joshua's life and of this book about his life is to faithfully obey God. Serving God is beyond our power to do in ourselves. But we've already seen he has given to us everything we need to live godly lives, to grow in our Christ-likeness. So follow him faithfully. So we're called just to ask ourselves in response to these chapters, how are we responding to the promises and the provisions and the grace of God? Complacent? Discontent? Confidently moving ahead? Faithfully obeying? That's what God calls us to do. Adrian Solano is a snow skier from Venezuela. A number of years ago, he managed to qualify for the Nordic World Ski Championships in Finland. After almost falling at the starting gate, he wobbled and fell down right after he left it. He took a tumble on one of the first curves and repeatedly fell, running out of time to complete the course when he was only a third of the way through. Twitter immediately labeled him the world's worst skier. What nobody knew is that Solano, being from Venezuela, didn't have the opportunity to train on snow. That he had trained by putting wheels on skis, and skiing with wheels is a lot different than skiing on the snow. But what I love is his response when he was being mocked. He said, maybe I have fallen many times. But what really counts is that I will always continue to rise. I like that. That's a challenge to all of us in our spiritual lives. See, God could have given Israel all the land under Joshua. Joshua could have driven out all the Canaanites, but he didn't do it that way. Instead, he chose to make it so they needed to claim their inheritance. God could have made us perfect the moment we accepted Jesus Christ as Savior. Or he could have called us home the moment we accepted Christ. But he didn't. He left us here in the battle as trophies of his grace. And he challenges us. Don't stop short of the finish line. And when you fall, continue to rise. Continue to get up. God's part is that he's faithful in providing all we need. Our part is that we have to claim the promises, and live for Christ. You see, God's promises are solely by grace to us. But enjoyment of them, it's determined by obedience. Let's pray together. With your heads bowed, I'd just like you to quietly ask yourself, is there an area that I need to claim for God in my life? If so, commit it to him right now while I pray. And so, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you that you keep promises. Help us in response to be faithful, to move ahead confident in what you are doing in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As most of you know, we are talking about entering into a capital campaign. And several weeks ago, we had a Vision Sunday. We talked about what that would look like. And uh, the drawings are out there if you want to take a look at them. Well, the company that we have engaged to help us with this assessment of whether we should move ahead or not would like to have one more survey done. And so the men are coming, passing out surveys. I would ask you, please don't do anything with those until I give you some instructions. Take one sheet and then pass them down. If you are a member or regular attender, 18 years of age or older, please take one. You will notice on there, there is a QR code. So if you choose to use the QR code, just pull out your phone, take a picture of that code, and it will pop up, and you can do the survey digitally, and I encourage you to do that. If you do that, pass the, uh, the, the surveys you don't need down to the aisle, and somebody will collect them and give them to somebody who does. So as they're not passing out the specific numbers, so if you get to the end of the aisle and there's extras, just wave them at an usher and they will collect them. 
This is an anonymous survey. I will say that several times this morning. This is anonymous, so you can fill it out. Please don't sign your name. We want you to be honest, brutally honest, if you need to be with this survey. Uh, When we complete distributing them, I'll give some instructions, and then we're just kind of walk through it and fill it out together this morning. The purpose of the survey is that Church Growth Services wants to identify for us the best financial goal that we could hope to attain in a capital campaign. They also want to gauge the interest and the commitment level of us as a congregation. So they have this survey designed, and you may have answered other, these similar kinds of questions before, but I want to encourage you, you've had some time to think and pray about it. You've perhaps seen the frequently asked questions. There are pencils in the rack in front of you if you are using a a physical survey. If you need a pencil or you need a survey, would you just put your hand up right now and wave and we'll make sure that you get one. Anybody still need a survey or you need a pencil to fill it out? All right, great. Looks like everybody is ready. So let's just kind of fill this out together as we walk through it. The first question is whether you are in the first or second service. If you don't know that, maybe you shouldn't fill out the rest of the survey, okay? (laughs) So fill that out, and then the next five questions are all really just demographic questions. Are you part of Berean? Are you a member? How many years have you been attending? How many people, kids and adults, live in your household? It's anonymous, remember, so you can circle your age group without fear. And what is your occupational status? So what are you? Full-time, part-time, looking for a job, student, retired, homemaker? So fill out those, just simple check marks or circle or a number. And then we come to question number six, which may be the one that some of you may say, well, wait a minute. It's a question about estimated household income. But I remind you, this is anonymous. Nobody is going to see this except your growth services. They're going to compile this. Nobody's going to give out any individual kind of data. But it is to help them know what might be a realistic goal for us in a capital campaign. So please, only one person in the household uh, answer this unless you keep your income separately. Don't worry about gross or net. Just what do you think your income is when you think about income? If you currently don't have one, just leave it blank. And remember, this is anonymous and it is confidential. We won't see it. Only church growth services will. Questions 7 and 8 are pretty straightforward. Do you participate actively in Sunday school? Did you attend Vision Sunday? Or if you were out of town, did you watch it? should be pretty easy to know that. Questions 9 through 11 are just a strongly disagree to st- strongly agree to strongly disagree. Number 9, I, I understand the proposed building project, what it is. The drawings are out there. You can look at it further if you want. The reasons given on Vision Sunday to invest are acceptable to me. Do I strongly agree or do I strongly disagree? The proposed building plan meets our current ministry needs. Now, it doesn't meet all of them, but does it meet a ministry need? Again, just mark it in that range what you believe is true in this case. In all of the rest of the questions, there's going to be a question followed by another question. If you mark strongly agree or agree, you don't need to worry about the follow-up question. But if you are neutral or if you disagree or strongly disagree, and if you do, that's fine. We would just like you to to provide some additional comments that might help us understand or help them as they analyze it. We won't see it. Understand why you answered the way you did. So should we conduct a capital giving campaign to challenge our congregation to financially support the project? Related to that is the next question. I believe now is the right time to proceed with that capital giving campaign. Again, if you agree or strongly agree, you can just hang loose. If you will mark one of the other choices and you feel like there's a reason you'd like us to know, please share that and Church Growth Services will let us know that. And then finally, 16, this is not a commitment. We're not asking you to sign what you're going to give, but would you be willing to give toward it? Would you be willing to support it financially? Again, agree, strongly agree, you're you're done. If it's the other three choices, if you could give us a reason why, and we certainly would love Church Growth Services to compile that and let us know that. 
Then if you're done, fold it in half. Now, if you did it on your phone, don't fold your phone in half unless one of those ones that folds in half, you can. Fold it in half just once, please. Don't make an origami out of it. And then as you leave, there are boxes where you picked up your bulletins, and there's one at the Welcome Center. If you would just drop those surveys in there, uh, we would appreciate you doing that. You can just leave the pencils in the pew rack in front of you. If there are blank surveys, you can just drop those at the Welcome Center, but not in the box, please. So I want to thank you for providing us with this kind of information. Church Growth Services has been great to work with, and they're going to give us information based on this that will be a big help to us. So you've given us the gift of your time and your opinion this morning, and we're thankful because we really do want to seek what God wants here. We want to move ahead with God's will and honoring Him. And so thank you for participating in this this morning. And after I close in prayer, you are free to leave. Let's pray. Father, we have just looked into your word, how you faithfully guide and provide for your people, and we know you're going to do that. Whether the answer we receive from church growth services is yes, move ahead, or wait a while, or don't go, we will accept that from your hand, Father. Help us as a church body to discern what you are doing and what you are saying to us. And help us as individuals to move ahead in Christ-likeness, trusting confidently in what you have promised us in your word. We pray in Jesus' name.